Welcome to the Deep Adaptation Q&A with Professor Jem Bendel. Jem uh, introduced Deep Adaptation last July with a paper that went viral and he really didn't expect it. Uh, he was about to move on in his career. Uh, and so this has all been a bit of a surprise for him and for the rest of us that are helping us. So let's start by asking Jem, what is deep adaptation? Morning, Matthew, and morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Can people put a thumbs up just to see that I'm coming through okay? Brilliant. Lovely to see you all. This is the first time I've used Zoom quite in this way uh, as a Q&A or witnessed it being used this way I, as well. Uh, what is deep adaptation? That's a good first question. How do we come up with that one, Matthew? Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to come up with a way of talking about uh, what do we do if we, if we think that collapse is now inevitable, likely, or already unfolding. And so my sense, I did that because my sense was that people didn't know how to talk about this. It was it was taboo. It definitely still is taboo in most professional circles, particularly my field of sustainability, sustainable development, uh, environmental management. And I felt that one of the reasons why it's taboo is that people just didn't have a common language for how to talk about it. The idea was that if you felt it's too late to stop disruptive climate change, then you're giving up and the conversation stops there. So I thought, let's actually come up with a framework which says, no, no, we, we, we have to start talking about this now beyond the superficial notion of adaptation, uh, which is mainly focused. It's based on the premise that we can keep our industrial consumer society going. That's why I called it deep adaptation to differentiate it from the mainstream climate adaptation agenda, uh, which uh, is premised on the idea that we can keep uh, life as we know it going. So yeah, deep adaptation is premised on an acceptance of a societal collapse, uh, by which I mean the, the uneven ending of our current modes of sustenance, security, uh, pleasure, identity, uh, meaning. Uh, so how that will unfold, I don't know. Um, I'm looking at it with other people now. But uh, how to respond is really important. And then I ended up uh, mapping out four, four R's. So sort of questions to help guide us all in thinking through what to do in the face of, of collapse. Thank you. And so we've been working all together for many weeks now to um, install and launch and migrate people on to the Deep Adaptation Forum. And that process is still ongoing. We've got uh, what, a couple of hundred people there now, and we're about to start inviting people in in much larger numbers. Can you tell us why you have launched the forum? Yeah, so as you mentioned in the opening, uh, my writing that paper was uh, in July last year. I wrote it uh, to speak to my professional community in sustainable business policy and practice and research and it was to say I think that we have been living a lie uh, and it was really to explain why after 25 years in that field I'm, I'm moving on. Uh, so I didn't really see my future uh, necessarily in academia. I, I wasn't really sure what what I was going to be doing next uh, with this realization that I was sharing in the paper. Uh, but the reaction to the paper was, uh, yeah, I had no idea. I think, I don't know, you're counting Matthew, aren't you? Uh, is it somewhere near 300,000 downloads or accessing of the audio files now? Uh, and yeah, so hundreds, if not more uh, people that are getting in touch from around the world spanning a spectrum of um, young mothers uh, grieving the, f the fact that they've had a child all the way through to former heads of the UN Secretary General office uh, saying he's telling everyone from Davos to Bilderberg 
about me and deep adaptation. So it it suddenly I felt I felt a, res, a story of some people call it a, a, an obligation or responsibility story. I felt it was inappropriate. It, did, it wouldn't have felt right to walk away from this now that uh, uh, it's emotionally affecting people so much. I mean, people literally crying on Skype when I'm talking to them and, and myself crying to people. It's, um, and also then people in senior roles in the EU, UN and elsewhere um, in, uh, really wanting to work on this and not knowing how. And floods of people getting in touch with me thinking that because I published this, I somehow have answers. Uh, or if they sort of introduce me to someone, then that's them sort of doing their bit. Uh, and that's not the case. I don't have the answers. And me just showing up at some meeting or giving a speech isn't really doing very much. So I wanted to encourage other people to connect around this because my offer of the concept of deep adaptation was to provide a means for people to talk to each other meaningfully after collapse acceptance. So I thought I'd help that along. Another reason was I began to see that some people were responding from panic in a way that they started to talk about, we must do whatever it takes to preserve the human race. But then when you looked at what they really meant, they meant to give people like them a better chance of survival than other people. And so I started to see, and, and a lot of sort of suggestions that we can suspend uh, various different values, rights, uh, and various different beliefs as just part of a civilization which is collapsing. And I, I felt that's, I understand why people respond in that way, but I, I wanted to promote a different way of processing these scary emotions uh, and invite curiosity, compassion, respect, uh, rather than sort of uh, just sort of... A, a lot, I, I, I was worried what may happen, so I, that was also a reason why I, I decided to stay involved. And so the Deep Adaptation Forum is a platform for people who are professionally involved or wish to be professionally involved in this deep adaptation agenda to connect with each other and co-create uh, resources and guidance and advice and help each other. Uh, we've just launched it. Uh, it's got lots of subgroups in different areas uh, from food to policy to, to coaching and counseling. Uh, and we're gonna also now be launching uh, Zoom uh, gatherings for each of those different subject areas uh, in time next month. So that's the, the reason it's a way of enabling well I, I talk it about as embodying and enabling loving responses to our predicament uh that's the the idea and helping professionals who feel at the moment a bit isolated where they're working to connect with each other in the end i suppose in a few years time uh this won't be taboo uh things will be unfolding before all our eyes uh but in the at the moment it makes sense to help people who want to work on it now uh to connect with each other I'm wondering, Matthew, um, have you, have you, um, can you see everybody with your, with your screen or does it just go to me? Uh, I can see a handful of people. Okay. All right. Uh, I just can think... you tell us slightly more concretely uh, what will happen in the forum? Because you say people will connect with each other, but mm -hmm. uh, it takes more than that to achieve something. Sure. So to begin with, it really is just a means of connecting because hundreds, if not thousands of people have been getting in touch and, and obviously 300,000 or more people reading the paper. And so it provides a way for people to reach out to each other. Uh, so that's the first thing. and It's important in that way. But what the forum will be doing is then helping people step up to curate or uh, coordinate a group within their professional area uh, and then giving them tools to do so. But also we're going to be looking for uh, people to collaborate on, on uh, documenting knowledge needs and also the relevant skills and resources uh, to meet those needs. I am hoping that um, we'll be able to um, seek funding also to then employ people to really start serving those groups better and also rewarding those volunteers in time as well. Thanks, Thank Tamara, for, for suggesting. Yeah, I think for the recording, uh, Matthew, so that anyone who sees this on YouTube later can see all the people joining from around the world. If you just sort of 
click to gallery view, then, then that means someone on YouTube will be able to later to, through the recording, see everything. We'll see people. Okay. Yes, Simone. Hello. <laughs> um, can you tell us and, something and your about friends. The, uh, Jen, can you tell us something about the reaction you've had from people in high up places? Some of them you know, some of them have uh, written to you out of the blue. Um, sure. So I'm not going to name names, but people in UN agencies, uh, people in, uh, in the European Commission, quite senior, uh, have, have reached out. Uh, I think there is a growing awareness uh, across, uh, well, there's a growing awareness across the world, but therefore also within um, Seen, uh, within senior roles in, in major institutions about about climate change and where we're at. I mean, that's that's pretty obvious from the the weird weather since last year. Uh, everyone is talking about climate change now. And as soon as you start looking into the, the science, people should get worried. And of course, the IPCC finally started sounding the alarm bells much more clearly with their latest report, which said that we have to do the impossible every year for the next 12 years to have a chance of avoiding catastrophe. So that's, you know, that's a mainstream organization, not just uh, fringe people. So that's really um, clearly waking people up. I haven't, uh, yeah, it's okay, there, there, there is one, there's one thing to say. Uh, there are some people high up in UN agencies that have said that they, they're pretty clear that we do not have the decision-making architecture internationally to uh, avoid major conflict when uh, weather disruption impacts our, our, our bread baskets around the world at the same time. So, for example, you know, the human race could cope with um, a multi-bread basket failure, say, in five years' time, uh, where you know drought means that there's a collapse in agriculture in Russia, Ukraine, and, and, and America all at the same time. We we could cope with that if we had uh, incredible levels of, of of cooperation internationally with a focus on on people being fed. The, the problem is we're not like that already today. We we you know we feed pets and cattle while babies starve. So I don't quite see why things will be will be different unless of course we have some amazing um, humanitarian or spiritual uh, awakening within the next few years. Uh, we can hope, we can work, we can pray, we can advocate for that spiritual or humanist awakening. Uh, the problem is it's unlikely to happen. So we're likely to make it worse. A lot of people I talk to either think that... Um everything that's going to carry on as normal, as it always has, uh, at least in our lifetimes. And a lot of other people think that um, it's only a matter of very few years and that collapse will be inevitable and that there's nothing we can do about it. Where do you stand on that spectrum? Um, yeah, so uh, I think a lot of people confuse positions on this. So... Um, I, through the research I did la last year, uh, my truth is that a, a collapse of industrial consumer society and institutions of polit uh, political institutions and economic systems associated with that uh, is inevitable in my lifetime and probably within 10 years. That, that was my conclusion. That was the close, that when that was, closer to my truth than saying it's likely or uh, it's possible. Now, other people have challenged me on that to say, well, you can't say something is, is inevitable. We obviously don't know if we have a technological eureka and so on, but so there's so much warming already uh, locked into the system because of the heating of the oceans uh, that, that even if we had miracle uh, geoengineering and we had miracle uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, direct air capture, um, and if we had amazing you know, global effort at uh, seaweed planting, unprecedented, starting yesterday, we, we, would, we will still, I think, um, not cope with 
uh, are basically through the impacts, uh, weather impacts on our agriculture uh, with, within five to 10 years uh, would be my, my guess when we will begin to see um, uh, a, a major disruption, hunger in many countries, if not most countries, and therefore civil unrest and, uh, um, and potentially international wars as a result of that as well. So uh, we can argue and we can push for a different approach. But you're saying that many people you meet say there's nothing we can do about it. Well, that I, I, I would disagree. Um, um, we're all going to die anyway. That doesn't mean there's nothing we can do about the way we live. Um, you know, so it's, it's a peculiar thing to sort of say, oh, collapse is coming, so there's nothing we can do. That that's, to me is just illogical. It means that we need to look at ways of integrating that awareness into the way we live today. Uh, that that can lead some people to um, thinking in a nihilistic and hedonistic way, but it can also lead other people to ask deep existential questions around the meaning of life, the true nature of their existence, their existence as soul or as part of a, a universal being. And therefore, with from that place, which tends to be one of loving compassion, then look at the world again and their choices and what they want to do in life. So um, it, if people are saying collapse is coming and therefore there's nothing to do about it in a way of sort of a kind of like a disdain, a disdain for humanity and a disdain for their existence, um, then that's just, that's just where they're at. They're disdainful. That means their confusion and anger is flowing into disdain rather than flowing into creativity, compassion and action. Um, so I think, we, we need to help each other. I, I talk about it as the philosophy for the forum. Uh, we, we need to help each other return to compassion, return to curiosity, return to um, creativity. Thank you. Um, so you, um, you were behind the launch of Extinction Rebellion somehow, and I know as your diary manager that you're going to speak in London on Rebellion Day on the 15th of April. Why is that? Do you think that uh, lots of people gathering in the street are going to help? Yeah, so my, my involvement in Extinction Rebellion came about because uh, I gave a speech at a conference uh, in the UK uh, about my paper in September, and a member of the audience uh, was the founder, Gail Bradbrook's best mate, mm -hmm. Uh, her name's Skeena Rathor, and she went home and met Gail, and uh, they talked it through, and she decided to join the rebellion and became one of the key people there. And so through Skeena, I've therefore met the other founders uh, and talked to them about strategy and so on. So, so since it, uh, before it was actually launched in November, and, and I was one of the academics. I was one of the... One of the, 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 the uh, leading academics who led the, the the hundred academics who signed support for the launch of the Extinction Rebellion before their first action. So, yeah, I've I followed it from the start. Uh, I am interested in it because I recognise that people need a way of coming together. With it's 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 terrifying when we see what's happening day to day with the news coming in across our screens about the latest, new, uh, latest speed of melting or release of permafrost or methane levels in the atmosphere or latest for forest fires, uh, uh, desertification. It's all, it's, 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 once you're conscious of what this all adds up to, it's terrifying. In fact, it's quite triggering. It's like, it's like a trauma response. So I recognize that people need to come together. The Extinction Rebellion is providing a means of that happening. So it's not just about civil disobedience. There's so many uh, local groups where people are meeting regularly and also helping each other in terms of deal with those very difficult emotions. So this is, they, they organize something called an aching heart group, sort of run by grief tenders. So um, I, although the, at the moment Extinction Rebellion is mainly focused uh, on government action to cut carbon uh, it is also within its third call, uh, recognizing uh, it implies that uh, collapse will occur. It talks about citizens' assemblies preparing for how to come out of the wreckage. 
to uh, so help society out of the wreckage. So it's, it's, I've, I've got a chapter in their book that's coming out where I'm calling for Extinction Rebellion to be more explicit about uh, it's too late to stop a catastrophic, catastrophic impact on our way of life. And therefore, we need to start talking about that and preparing. Um, I'm, I've also agreed with the founder of Extinction Rebellion uh, to run an, in, uh, an international conference on deep adaptation. So Gail Bradbrook and I will be doing that as well. So they, they, they are aware of it, but it's just not at the forefront of their messaging at the moment. So yeah, my speech in London, I will be, I will be saying that a, a focus on adaptation is not the enemy of urgent action to cut carbon. In fact, if we don't prepare for the damaging consequences, if we all start going hungry and, 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 and we, we aren't helping each other out, then we're not really going to give much of a toss about cutting carbon anymore. You know, if, you're, if your children are starving uh, or if you can't heat your home, are you going to worry about burning coal? I think the, the two, mitigation and adaptation, go hand in hand. Thank you. One last question from me. Uh, before that, hands up. Who's seen Jen's video that she made from Bali? Just came out a few days ago. Okay, look out for that. Um, Jen, why did you make the video in Bali? Okay, so you're talking about the, uh, the nine-minute short film, Grieve, Play, Love. Um, uh, I made it um, because I wanted to... Um, I wanted to offer something which f for people who've read my paper or who for some other reason have arrived at, at a place of despair. Um, and I wanted to share, I wanted to share my story about how I uh, felt despair over climate change and how I was initially scared of despair and so pushed away, pushed it away. But then in the end, I let it come. I let it disintegrate my sense of self. But the way I found, uh, the, the way I found through it uh, was uh, actually through finding ways of uh, um, connecting more with uh, other people and with nature and uh, realizing that I, I didn't, need my old stories of self of, of self-worth or identity uh, and that I could let all that go and then piece together a new sense of self with a sort of like love as the as the anchor love as the foundation and and I I made that as a film because I and I made it in Bali because I was in Bali at the time I took a year out from university to to look at the climate science and to also to volunteer for you Matthew if you remember on uh, your work um, so I was in Bali, and so I so I knew a filmmaker there, and I and and what I was doing in Bali did change me. It provided a, a a very beautiful space for me to let go of my old stories of self that I didn't even know I had, uh, as a, a sort of a striving academic and activist. So that's why I'm hoping that it's um, I'm hoping I've, I'm hoping it will be useful to some people. The thing is, it's a bit of an artistic project in the sense that it's it's very visual and it's it's very emotive, and so it's quite provocative in that way. And you know, so it's more like art. So it's not like a it's not like a paper or a report. Uh, I realise some people will like it and some people will hate it, and that's okay. It, it, it's what artists say, isn't it? And they say, well, as long as people are impacted in some way and think, if you hate it, make your own film. Uh, to help people is what I would suggest. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the book by Extinction Rebellion earlier on. Do you know the title of it? We've had a question. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't. It's going to be, it's, it's, I think it's published by Penguin and it should be out uh, on Rebellion Day, if not before, so 15th of April. So coming very soon. I hope okay. my chapter's still in there. <laughs> um, it's, a bit, it's a bit off message. Because it's saying, it works to say, this is the last chance to save humanity. We must do everything now. And of course, I heard that 20 years ago. In fact, I've heard that every, every month for the last 20 years. Um, 
I think 10 years ago, there were lots of people saying this is the last year we can uh, save ourselves from catastrophic climate change. So, um, so yeah, my, my, my chapter is saying you, we, can find, we can find a new basis for urgent, bold action on mitigation, uh, which doesn't pretend that we can stop a collapse. Okay, now we turn to some questions from the participants. Firstly, Ian Struthers. He asked the question, but he, he's not confident his microphone is working and has asked me to read it on his behalf. So his question is, how do you think deep adaptation will be interpreted and communicated politically? What do you think is the best way to communicate it to citizens? All right. Hello, Ian. Um, although I can't, I, we, we could unmute you just to say hi. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, where are you joining from? Uh, I'm in Edinburgh. In okay. Oh, so Great. You can hear I, <laughs> yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Oh, that's so good. Polit po politics question. Um, it's interesting you ask that because I used to work in politics. Uh, I, I, I worked for the, the leader's office in the Labour Party in the UK in 2017. And I was involved in the general election in 2017. I wrote bits of the manifesto. I wrote a couple of co-wrote a couple of speeches for Jeremy Corbyn and one for John McDonnell. Uh, and I did that. Um, I didn't have a policy role. It was just comms. So I didn't talk about the end of the world. They were really busy. So I thought maybe I shouldn't add that to their agenda. Um, uh, but I had a clear idea about why I was doing that work at the time, which is Jeremy Corbyn had brought back into British politics uh, discussions around values and that we're proud of the fact we care for each other. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, after decades of neoliberalism and the idea that politics is just managing the system more efficiently uh, and you're almost like embarrassed to talk about your love of your neighbor uh, and solidarity and so on. Uh, he was he was wearing these values uh, on his sleeve. So I, that attracted me and I, because I feel that to reduce the harm from what's coming from uh, climate disruption, uh, we need to uh, drop our delusions around uh, money, uh, profit, corporations, what is business, you know, what is business, you know, all these ideas about um, what is pragmatic. Um, we need, and I, I talked about it as like, we need some emergency socialism. Um, so, so that was why I got involved there. Um, but I then haven't been involved since. I, I haven't been involved since the day of the general election in 2017, and I ended up doing all this other stuff in 2018. So uh, how to get deep adaptation into politics? I am aware that behind the scenes uh, in the Labour Party, they are looking at the component parts of it uh, because 2018 weather was so bad, it did get people talking about what what should uh, government policy include to ensure food security, uh, financial system security, water security, and energy security. So I think also part of the excuse for that in the British context was the potential for a no deal Brexit. And so my people wanted to see how how Britain might cope if, if, if international trade into the UK was disrupted. So that I don't know how, I'm not inside the Labour Party, so I don't know how far they've gone with that. I think you'll know, because you're in Edinburgh, that nothing, I think, has been said publicly by the Labour Party or any politician about, about preparing for economic or social collapse because of an environmental breakdown. No, uh, it's not really a vote winner, I would say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how, how to address uh, that would be... You know, yeah. How, well, do you, how do you tell people really, really bad news, and then expect them to continue in the in the political system that we have, the decision making architecture that you mentioned? Yeah. So the only way that the only way that I've done it is to talk to councillors, uh, because councillors it it tends to be they're less scared of what the papers say. They're less okay. scared of being lampooned. And so, for example, I. 
I, uh, I spoke at a, uh, an event of uh, Lancaster County Council, uh, La Lancaster City Councillors ahead of their declaration of a climate emergency. And I talked about deep adaptation and I suggested they include preparing for potential collapse of, of food supply as, as part of what the a climate emergency should involve. I haven't read the text of it, but I believe they've included that. And the thing was, is that, you know, in a small group of 30 people, uh, I found that that was a more appropriate place to, to talk. I mean, these are, there was a ability to work across party lines as well around this, much more so than in national politics. Uh, so I, and I, I think that the climate emergencies that have been declared across in different county and city councils across the UK, many of them have been including um, language around preparing uh, for uh, disruption to our way of life, and so where councils will be looking what they can to, for what they can do. Uh, so I think maybe at that level, I think, and then when you work up from from there, because um, it plays this question plays into another question, which is how useful is it to bring this message to the general public in a, a way that's where they're not supported to process it? At the moment, for example, um, the psychotherapy profession is, is only just in the last six months in the UK really looking into this and seeking to train themselves about how to, do with, to deal with eco-anxiety or climate anxiety. Uh, so I think we, we need to get these ideas um, out there, but also in a way that um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean we need to bring the deep adaptation message to the general public right now. Um, I, I think we need the professions uh, to uh, you know, psychotherapy, but also others to actually get their heads around this. So I'd, I'd like people who work in, in agriculture, uh, in food, food security to really start looking at this. So my focus at the moment is more on that rather than, so for example, I've turned down invitations to go on Newsnight and other mainstream programs. I, I'm looking to help connect people who can actually work on, work on this professionally in some way, because otherwise you're just dumping uh, terrifying news on people unsupported. And okay, I mean, that might work, but I'm, I'm, I'm targeting, I'm putting my efforts in a different place. Ian, do you have any ideas about how to message around this or how to talk to politicians or get this on the political agenda? <laughs> um, well, not, not really. I don't think I could really add anything to what you've said there. Um, but I have found that um, being vocal on, uh, on Twitter, which is just something that started in the last few months, uh, has been really good for my own mental health. Um, because I, at least I feel some modicum of activism every day, whenever I can. And I get a lot of feedback from people in the real world, so to speak, you know, people who I meet face to face uh, as a result of that. And, and mm -hmm. that's maybe not political. You do get some political, but that for me is probably my only contribution at this stage. And really, I'm just a bit lost as to how we're going to proceed with the decision making architecture that you mentioned. Um, at the yeah, moment. I know that um, that there's a project uh, in Scotland that Seedbed are funding to bring people together uh, and to look at resilience at community level. Um, okay. So um, if you join the community action group within the Deep Adaptation Forum, I'll make sure that uh, we that uh, that we share information there. Uh, I think there's a, okay. a lady called uh, Bronner that's uh, leading that work. Okay, thank you. It, uh, so, uh, Matthew, you you say you've got six questions for me. Do you want to? Yeah, next question is from Daniel Kerpel. I've unmuted you, Daniel. Are you there? Uh, <clears throat> how you doing, Matthew? Great, thanks. Yeah, calling you guys from Switzerland. How you doing, guys? Um, Hello. Great uh, pleasure, uh, honor, and uh, I following. Uh, I was in the army when I read your paper, and then I did uh, your MOOC um, Money and Society course, and since subsequently joined uh, a Zeitper, as we call it, a time exchange uh, mm -hmm. here in Switzerland. And actually, I, I'm using your deep adaptation as one of the offers I'm trying to bring into the people. Um, 
which would be interested here in St. Gallen, east of Switzerland. Uh, my question is a little bit, I, I see a lot of uh, um, solutions you bring up, uh, across which are rather spiritual, almost hippie-like, which I think they're all great. Uh, being a man of 50 years, I'm struggling with the energy requirements which they require to switch uh, like the normal life, what one has towards a spiritual hippie-like um, behavior to use that as a, a, a solution recommendation to people who might be interested or, as you said, who actually are already scared. Because I'm, I think I might be the wrong person because I'm very pragmatic, pragmatic uh, action-focused through my uh, sustainability-related work. So how, and you entered that a little bit already, how, how would you suggest like a step-by-step -step approach for like a, a normal consumer move towards a little bit more spiritual, more open behavior. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, a step-by-step -step, uh, means of response. Um, I think the, the first step is to start talking to people who don't think that you're mad or depressed. So you need to find people who are like you, uh, seriously considering societal collapse uh, as, as either inevitable or likely or very possible. So you can act, or at least prepared to talk to you about what if, and then you can begin to have meaningful conversations. And those people, if you can't find them locally or from your existing friends or families, uh, uh, contacts, then it's, it's through things like the Positive Deep Adaptation Facebook group that I launched two weeks ago. Um, so make those connections and have those conversations because there is no, there is no right, uh, well, there is one sec right second step for everyone and I'd say that it, it's relinquishment. So it's basically, you need, to, you need to create space in your life for a transformation to occur. So first of all, find people to talk to. And secondly, try to simplify. And that might mean that, you know, if you've got a big mortgage on your house, then, then that's not going to be very good. Or if you've got a, a job, which means you're exhausted, you've got no time for, uh, for, for thinking or feeling outside of that. Um, so, yeah, so the first one is connect. Second is uh, make sure you've got extra time than you did have through relinquishing some maybe... Maybe you've got a, got a nice car on higher purchase or something. Or, 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 you know, so so it's, it's a basically downshifting approach. Then the third step is whatever happens. I mean, so for some people, that will then mean that they find solace in uh, spiritual practices, meditation or breath work or joining a church or becoming a Sufi or um, uh, becoming a Buddhist or who knows. Um, but for other people it will be becoming a, an activist. For other people, it will be seeking to be really bold, um, reckless in their job in terms of the messages they bring and the challenges they bring to the senior hierarchy. Uh, and that you just risk losing your job because you're going to be so provocative around what should really be done in your organization. Who knows what the response will be? Um, obviously, some people also will want to become preppers. So that I, I'm told that there are even businesses in Germany now that can come around and check out your house and your nutrition and your sport and your physical routine and help you prepare uh, for this. Um, so some people are doing that. I mean, the third step is whatever. I just invite people not to tool up to kill each other. Uh, I, I think uh, that's probably not going to work very well for very long. In fact, it will make things worse. Okay, thank you, Jim. Question from uh, John Wilkes, who I have unmuted. Hi, Jim. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm a therapist, and, and in my work, I see a lot of people getting, you know, obviously, uh, you mentioned, like, deep, you know, deeply upset, traumatized even by what's going on. And, and a lot of that is on a sort of unconscious level. And I suppose the, the, the side of this is that, you know, when you talk about things like survival, it tends to trigger people into, you mentioned like trauma. I mean, it does awaken some very, very early stuff for people, which is very, very difficult for them to be with and process. And also, um, you know, things like um, 
consumerism. I know, I know there was one psychotherapist who talked about it as, as a kind of addiction. And so when you have an addiction to something, there's often a lot of shame around being challenged around that comes in. So, so my question is really about how you perhaps dialogue with people in, a, in, in, in perhaps a kind of gentle way. Uh, uh, it was interesting you, you saying that you tend not to go on, on places like, like um, uh, you know, big news programs and stuff. But, it, but it's like, uh, I, I, I also see that sometimes when you confront people, they just tend to just go into denial or shame and then nothing happens. So my question is really, how, how do we dialogue to, to begin to make a change with some people when you're touching on these really, really difficult places? It's a, yeah, thanks, John. It's a very important question, the, the how. I've, I've reached out to the Climate Psychology Alliance uh, because I, I wasn't sure really how, how to talk about this. It was also, um, it was sometimes coming up uh, in conversation when I wasn't really thinking about, about it. So, for example, with my, with my parents, uh, I, my brother shared information on my work in the family WhatsApp group. And so then I, I had to start having that conversation. Uh, and that's really quite difficult um, because I haven't really worked out how to have conversations with people where uh, they haven't thought about climate change really at all, other than, than oh, it's another environmental issue like plastic in, in the oceans or recycling. Um, so I'm, I'm all ears in terms of suggestions about how best to do this. Uh, all, I've, all I've been telling people is what I just mentioned to Daniel, which is to, um, if people are feeling very difficult emotions about this, to then uh, talk to other people. And if they can't, <clears throat> if they can't uh, find that uh, in person, then to seek it out online. Um, and the but yeah i mean the psychotherapeutic profession is i think beginning to catch up i'll discover more on april the 13th in london at an event where 70 psychotherapists are coming together um i'd love to hear your thoughts about it i mean for me every every everyone every conversation i've had about this is is different um in sometimes there's tears um, sometimes people have read my paper before they talk to me about it. Um, I, I think what I've learned to do is to say that this doesn't mean that we're in any immediate danger because of course, as you say, these things can trigger trauma responses, uh, whether that's from childhood or from other, um, traumatic experiences later in life. Uh, and, the um, yeah, so so there's there's to reassure people that this doesn't mean that you know we should run for the hill for for the hills right now. But John, I'd be I'd welcome any ideas you've got on that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think as you said, it's a very individual thing, really, because people's experience about survival is is very individual. So I wouldn't say there is one way, um, and it's just something I'm I'm. I'm sitting with myself. I don't have any answers, unfortunately. Mm. It, well, it, would be great. it often feels like, you know, a supportive and, and, and part of the thing with, with trauma is often people feel on their own. So this, you, you know, your whole thing about creating community is, a, is an incredibly important thing from that point of view, where people have support, where they have a safe space in which to explore some of these very deep and difficult uh, issues. Yeah. Yes. And that's one of the things in the guidelines for the positive deep adaptation group is to avoid ever sort of invalidating people's emotions around this uh also avoid sort of trying to fix uh difficult emotions but to witness them uh those emotions and that's also with the moderator guidelines as well that we've we've developed but also um i'm i'm hoping that the coaching and counseling group on the the deep adaptation forum will also help us um learn more about about what to do and support the development of a range of different uh, support forms of support in person and online so hopefully if you're not on it yet john we'll see you there yeah definitely thank you very much thank you for your work okay we've got uh five questions queued in 10 minutes so uh nick osborne you are unmuted 
Thanks, I'll be quick. And this follows on really from the last question. I find when contemplating this prospect that you're talking about of collapse, it's very difficult to come into any kind of relationship with because it's so big and unpredictable and unknown. And one of the things that's helped me over the years in forming a relationship with it is comes from a methodology called scenario planning. You may have come across it. It's, it's where you, you map out a number of potential different pathways and potential future scenarios and look at what they might involve and then see how things are unfolding in relation to them. So I've put a link in the chat to, there's a permaculturist who wrote a book called Future Scenarios, which is basically four different potential scenarios of collapse and how they might unfold. And um, he's put the whole book on his website, so it's available on that link. And it's a way of not doing the whole predict and control thing, not trying to like predict how it's going to be in control, how we get there, but it's about a way to come into a relationship with how things might be going and it's some ways to prepare to adapt. Mm. Um, I'm just curious if that approach is informing your, what you're doing in any way or if you think it might be helpful, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And in case the, uh, the link doesn't show in the video, uh, that's futurescenarios.org. Org. Um, I haven't looked at that methodology for this, although I'm aware of it from, it was used in South Africa, wasn't it, in the process beyond apartheid. Mm. I, I, um, and I know Forum for the Future used it as well for other, other reasons. So I think it, it makes a lot of sense because it is really difficult to know what to do. So for example, in June 2017, no, June 2018, Matthew and I with friends went on a tour of places in Greece where we thought we might uh, go and live to um, live more sustainably off the land. And um, I think two of the five places we visited were surrounded by flames the following, the following uh, month. It was a bit of a, a wake up call in terms of you can, you know, if you, it's very difficult to to decide where where to go to be safer it's very difficult uh, also then at a larger scale to know which particular policy to push for so uh, and i keep being asked now from people you know well where how is collapse going to unfold and where should i move to where should i take my kids what should, how, how should, and people even now wanting to know how to protect your money uh, will hyper will there be hyperinflation where how will, and so there are all these questions that are naturally being raised and i and i'm not an expert on this and i so what i'm doing is i am inviting other people to use various different methodologies to analyze uh, what may happen and when and how um so it's great to hear future scenarios i will go and have a look at it um and yes the, the question then becomes to backcast what are the behaviors what are the things i can do now to be better uh, able to um, be okay and help other people be okay, no matter which of those scenarios comes about. So um, I'll, um, I'll just have to mute. Someone is typing on their phone, on, the, uh, on, on their laptop, unmuted. Thanks, that's enough from me, thanks. Okay, cheers. Matthew has disappeared, so I'll keep talking then. Um, Alan, you seem to be unmuted. I am, so as, thank you. As Matthew, Hello, everybody, as and thank you. Uh, oh, so many questions I could ask, but I think perhaps the most helpful that I can imagine is to know what you think is the biggest missing bit at the moment from what you think needs doing. If there's one thing, if you could wave a magic wand and say, I'd like to have that for where we are now, what would that bit be? Ah, oh, okay. Just one thing, Alan. I haven't prioritized just one thing. I could, I could name a few things. Yeah. Um, well, a few and things. Very, okay. Well, they're, they're, uh, and it depends. Because if it was a magic wand, then, then, it's a, I know a lot of people be upset with this, but I am worried about human extinction from a mass methane release in the Arctic. Uh, uh, some people think that human extinction will come one day and we're not that special, or if we are, consciousness will rise again. But I, I would prefer us not to go extinct in, mm, in the next sure. uh, 50, 50 years. 
So in that case, we should experiment with controlled experiments on marine cloud brightening over the Arctic to try and refreeze the Arctic. Otherwise, uh, we, we are looking at a potential um, um, catastrophic uh, temperature change when the, the, polar, uh, the Arctic ice cap goes, because we're going to see just in the same way that if you've got a, if you've got a glass of ice, Coca-Cola with ice in it, uh, and while the ice is still there, it keeps it cold. And when the ice is melted, it suddenly gets to room temperature really quickly. That's because of latent heat energy absorbed by melting ice. Same goes for the Arctic Ocean and also the lack of reflectivity of once the white ice turns into dark water. So Professor Wadhams predicts that that will be equivalent to about 50% of all anthropogenic warming just from removal of all the ice in the Arctic. So it basically means we're heading towards extinction if the, if the ice cap goes. So that one, I'd like us to be doing something right now to test it and see what happens, uh, but it to be very transparent and very accountable. Uh, so we, it's not hidden and we, we know what the implications might be for world weather. Secondly, we can't have the monetary system we have, which requires growth because otherwise, in order to keep the, uh, the, uh, the banks issuing new loans to keep our money supply inflated, uh, we need to do something about that. Um, thirdly, we have to have a systemic uh, decline of systematic, systemic decline of carbon emissions. So we need a global carbon tax. We need it embedded into trade law. So, that, uh, so we need it at the WTO. That's also an extremely weird idea for environmentalists like me, that you actually want the WTO to do something. Um, so those are, those are holding measures, basically. Um, yeah. Adaptation also needs to include, um, uh, I'm not an agronomist, but we need, to have, we need to prepare for the collapse of our major breadbaskets. So we need to look at um, uh, gr irrigated potato growing. Um, to give us our basic calories we need to have a global commission ready to look at how we could basically uh, um, uh, have emergency measures which would uh, try to keep everyone fed and watered in situ uh, if we have multi bread basket failure that would probably mean banning the meat industry globally uh, in order to keep everyone fed absolutely ridiculous concept mm. there'd be loads of people protesting uh, There'll be um, people who are losing their jobs, protesting at ports, and the police would go and have to remove them forcibly. If the police don't understand why this is necessary, it won't happen, and you'll have revolutions. So there's so much that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, world religions, there you go. The religions um, are going to have a huge... People are going to get scared and run to their temples and churches and priests and so on. At the, uh, we need uh, um, a, a revolution in consciousness uh, towards uh, with, not towards dogma. We need a Gnostic awakening through the world's religions. Um, so we need a world summit of religions in the face of collapse. You know, a, an apocalyptic summit of religions. Um, that would be helpful too. <laughs> Uh, we'll keep, we'll keep going. I haven't yeah, been asked. No, 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 can, oh, can I, thanks for that one. I, I'm just going to bring you back uh, it, it, internally into the infrastructure and the process from yes. your work and how you address those. Or the, is there a missing person or role or aspect of the process? So I'm bringing you back into your work rather than imagine the solutions or the priorities. That's what I'm trying to address. Forgive me for not, not being, although that was very helpful what you said. Okay. Um, so I, I'm torn between, uh, on the one hand, uh, thinking I can do anything on those things I just mentioned. Um, and on the other hand, thinking um, it's all pie in the sky so I should drop this uh, macho hero nonsense and instead be a more loving, kind person to the people who are affected by how I show up every day in life. So I've, I've, I'm trying to uh, have that balance. Um, and I don't know if I've got it yet. Um, you, can't, you can't do it all, can you? Yeah. So I'm, the Deep Adaptation Forum is my effort to... So that if people come across these ideas and they like the, the, the notion of deeply adapting, they look into it and they like some of the ideas, 
then they join the forum and then they can find other people and maybe things can happen. Now, the way we put this together is to avoid the bureaucratic processes of funding. So we just found yeah. two private donors who gave us a little bit of money and we haven't set up an organization. Basically, the donors pay the freelancers for their work directly. So I'm not having to set up an organization at this stage. So we can just get going, creating mm. a whole range of programs very and, and also we're also working with volunteers. We've got five amazing volunteers, moderators for the Facebook group. Now we're inviting volunteers to lead the different groups with professional groups within the forum. So we're trying to sort of bootstrap it. It's a bit like a startup methodology, really. Yeah. Um, and I'm nervous. So, for example, someone very senior in the U EU has got in touch and he's involved in a, a program of funding that gives 40 to 80 million euros a, a year on climate. But I don't want me and my team to spend months, three months, doing a, a, a huge funding proposal yeah. for the EU and yeah, then not correct. getting it because we scored badly in track record. Yeah. So, um, no, I'm asking for... I'm asking for people who can do things like, you know, offer two to 3,000 euros in a donation, and then it was very clear who's it going to and for the work they'll be doing. It doesn't come through me. So that's, yeah. how, I'm, that's how we're trying to piece it together at this stage. But by June, I'm going to have put together a two-year proposal for what the strategy and a plan for what the Deep Adaptation Forum will do in a budget, and that will be published, and I'll just be... I'll be, I'll be asking for donations. We might also do a crowdfunding and that would involve two or three full-time staff. It wouldn't be me. Um, mm. I, I don't want to work full-time on it. I will <laughs> probably, I'm not quite sure which route I'll go, but it, it, I'm, I am going to be communicating more regularly online. So we're, this is the first of something we're doing monthly. So we're going to have monthly Q and A's. I'm going to be hosting those next month. It's Carolyn Baker. I think the month after it's going to be Joanna Macy. Uh, we've also got Deb Ozarko and Sean Kelly and some others lined up. So uh, that mm -hmm. will be announced soon. Uh, I'm conscious of time, Alan. So let's go mm -hmm. back to Matthew to see what other questions we can squeeze in. Let's, if we just go five minutes over. I just wanted to add, Jan, those Q&As that you mentioned, they're only advertised from within the forum, aren't they? Or are they public? Uh, yes, you're you're right. We are. Um, although everyone can see those Q and A's uh, on our YouTube channel after the event, if you actually want to participate in them and actually speak to our experts and, and me, I, I'll host it. But then me and the expert, if you want to speak to us, uh, then you need to be a member of the Deep Adaptation Forum. And uh, there's an application process for that, where we're actually asking people who join that to be clear with themselves about. What will they actually be doing to help build out this field or this movement uh, rather than just observing and commenting or clicking like as, as tends to happen? If you just want to observe, then the Facebook group and the LinkedIn group are, are okay for that. But if, if you feel that there is a bit of time that you can spare to help co-create resources to guide your professional sector or um, to help out in some way, uh, hosting meetings, for example, um, or providing guidance to uh, somebody else in this field, uh, then the Deep Adaptation Forum is for you, and that's where we'll be advertising these future Q&As. Yes. Thanks, Matthew. Okay, so that's at deepadaptation.info. <laughs> yeah. So just uh, one final encore question from Rashmir. Uh, I chose this for the other questions because it's about corporate social responsibility which is a field that uh, Jem worked in for many years. Uh, Rashmir, I'm unmuting you. Great, thank you. Um, so super quick, really, because I used to work in um, more the social development side of philanthropy and looking at the intersections with companies and markets. So I'm really curious to hear what kind of reaction you've had from companies and to some extent philanthropies as well, particularly those companies, though, that are serious about their social and environmental um, work. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I've, I've been surprised at the number of people who, uh, like me, have worked in corporate responsibility and sustainability for decades and who are with me uh, now in my view as where we're at so that collapse is either likely or inevitable or already unfolding. Uh, even people like Gail Kell, uh, who was the founder of the UN Global Compact, which is the world's largest CSR initiative. Uh, he has read the paper. He's sending it to everyone he knows. 
uh, and he's trying to get the world of finance to think about this. Um, uh, there are I, and, and other people I know who are quite senior in the CSR field also uh, are aware of this. The way that they are responding at the moment is um, like we all are. I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to process what this, what this means uh, and trying to do something on it. And the something tends to be just telling people. Um, and to be honest, that's also what I'm doing at the moment. I mean, I haven't, I haven't developed many toolkits or implemented anything. I'm just trying to help people talk to each other, which is okay. Uh, I've been invited to give speeches at CSR conferences, and I've declined them because I haven't really quite worked out my message. You know, if, for example, if you're head of buying at Marks and Spencers, or if you're if you're the chief sustainability officer at uh, BT, I mean, what do you actually do with this with this uh, it, with this new paradigm that you know, things are going to break down? What, what, it's it's a difficult one. I haven't worked it out, and I thought I could just spend time on it, but then I thought there are other things, probably better use of my time right now, in sort of mapping out the the field more generally and inviting a particular philosophy of, of based on compassion, creativity, and so on, and also a crash course in psychology that I'm sort of on. So um, uh, I would recommend if you're interested in corporate responses to collapse and how people can do act from within their existing jobs, I go to reverse thrust, reverse thrust dot org, I think it is. And it's a friend and colleague of mine called Mark Lepatin. And he is the one who is working on how do corporates and, and investors uh, start to think this through and integrate it into their uh, st organizational strategies and everyday practices. Um, uh, is it, uh, I haven't checked this. It's either .org or .com, but I think it's reverse .org. Crust .org. Um, and, and so, for example, when people come to me and ask me now, I, I like, uh, like the triple bottom line reporting people and others, I, I put them onto Mark because he's, he's the one who's doing that. So, Rashmir, if you're actually interested in this, I can... Um, uh, can you email Matthew and Matthew can put Ma 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 Rashmir in touch with Mark Lepatin. Okay. Will do. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> Good. And if you have any thoughts yourself on this, then then do share. But if not, we can maybe we have you as an expert on this topic in six months in the Ooh, Q and A. I'm no expert yet, but maybe one day. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, please do join the business and finance group within the Deep Adaptation Forum. Because uh, there's also, I mean, there's, there's some very senior people in investment banking, in insurance, and in hedge funds who are in that group. So there are people now thinking about that. Brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet. It's not where my where my heart's at. I'm still trying to do some other things. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm focused a little bit more on say what schools can do and some other things. So I'll come back to the business world maybe in a month or two months, three months. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We are a few minutes over time. So I suppose that's it for our first Q&A, Matthew. Yes? Yeah. I just want to thank Marina G and Paul Simmons for asking questions that we didn't get around to. There's lots of ways of following and participating in Deep Adaptation. And uh, write to me and or Jen. It's the same thing. If you want to have a, a list of all the 10 drills we provide out into the internet. So I hope to see you next time. There's lots of space on this call because 115 people booked. And in the end, only 34 people here. So uh, we'll extend it a little bit further next time, I expect. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you. And uh, look forward to seeing you uh, in a month. Bye-bye.